Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Klaus Weber. I'm the Deputy Director of the uh, Buffett Institute of Global Affairs. Uh, and I um, have the great pleasure to welcome you to our um, research conversation series, um, uh, New Frontiers in Global Research. Um, the premise of our um, seminar series is that global challenges necessitate international and interdisciplinary collaboration. And we try and provide a forum for, for those kind of um, conversations that um, span across theoretical, empirical, institutional boundaries, uh, and really engage with um, some of the more complex global issues that we face today. Um, so we invite scholars, artists, um, um, people from outside academia sometimes to explore new spaces of global research and re-examine what we actually mean by global affairs and, and bring to the fore global dimensions of issues that we um, might otherwise not think as global issues. And today we turn to the nexus of art, culture and politics uh, for a conversation about research on uh, carcerality, U.S. imperialism, and visual culture. Um, we're very um, pleased to have um, two fantastic speakers um, and an equally fantastic moderator, um, Nicole Fleetwood, um, recently joined um, New York University as the inaugural James Weldon Johnson Professor of Media, Culture, and Communications at the Steinhardt School. Uh, she's a writer, curator, and art critic, um, with a very broad range of interests that range from uh, contemporary black diasporic art and visual culture uh, to gender and feminist studies, uh, black cultural history and poverty studies. Um, she's the author of um, Marking Time, Art in the Era of Mass Incarceration and curator of a traveling exhibition of the same name. Uh, we're also very pleased to welcome Ronek uh, Kapadia, who is an associate professor of gender and women's studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, and he's also affiliated with art history, global Asian studies, and museum ex and exhibition studies there. Uh, Ronak is an interdisciplinary queer studies scholar of race, culture, state violence, and empire in the late 20th and 21st century in the US. He's the author of um, Insurgent Aesthetics, Security and the Queer Life of the Forever War, and is currently working on a work, uh, uh, at work on a new project, um, uh, Breathing in the Brown Queer Commons. Um, so we're really lucky to have um, two fantastic um, panelists that uh, will provide um, uh, very, um, you know, fresh perspectives on, on um, issues that we face um, every day here. Um, our moderator um, is Ivy Wilson, um, our very own Associate Professor of uh, English and Co-Director of Northwestern Buffett's uh, new working group on race, case, and colorism. Ivy is also a key member of the Black Arts, Arts Consortium at Northwestern, and I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, say thank you to the Black Arts Consortium for co-sponsoring today's conversation. Um, I think I stop here uh, because you're far less interested in my um, sort of um, musings um, than in what our uh, panelists have to say. And so I turn it over to Ivy who will moderate the discussion. Thank you, Klaus. And uh, thank you to the Buffett Center for hosting this really wonderful event. And, um, you know, in the in the spirit of of acknowledgement and recognition, and also like to you know give my profound thanks to our colleague uh, Mecca, who really is a person who organized this. He's a a, a wonderful uh, art maker, a, a powerful critic, and um, a really kind of profound mobilizer of different kinds of communities, both inside academia and and outside. Um, I, I met as a graduate student, um, but we've long thought about him from the very beginning as a colleague here. And I think it's important for us you know, in our discussions about futurity to start thinking about different kinds of commons as, as another Ronick is, is thinking about as well. So thank you very much, Emeka. Um, but especially thank to uh, Ronick and, um, and Nicole for helping us uh, think alongside with you and inviting us to think alongside with, with you uh, about the issues of carcerality and aesthetics as they emerge through the national and into the global and back to the national and to the hyperlocal. Um, so I thought I would just begin with a, a broad question about the kind of perceptions of your book, which of both of your books, which have been you know, amazingly rewarding um, across a number of fields and perspectives. Um, both of them have received a lot of critical attention around the interventions they've made within the academy and uh, public discourse, we were wondering, you know, now that some time has passed since both of the books have been published, um, can you each talk 
a little bit about how some of the most insightful and kind of critical observations that have been made about your work and how, if at all, your views or approaches to these respective projects have changed since their publications. Let me start with Nicole if we can. So hi everyone. Um, thank you for the lovely introductions. Thank you for inviting us. Um, Ivy, thank you for moderating. Super happy to be here. Um, and Ronak is a dear friend and someone I actually talked with um, quite a bit as I was um, working on marking time and Ronak read parts of marking time for me. Um, so we've been in conversation um, for a while. I think our first, I think actually our first panel together was in Chicago. So it's <laughs> great to be back, even though virtually. Um, you know, where we started to dialogue. What, what I think it was 2013 or something. It was a long time ago. Is that right, Rona? Um, and so with marking time, um, this question about reception, it's, it's a great question that I feel like I'm, <laughs> I don't know if I'm prepared to answer it well. Um, I, I feel I, the, pro, the project for me feels performative in that um, I started working on it because I wanted to enact um, another possibility for being in proximity with my loved ones in prison. Um, and I imagined myself writing in a performative way where I was in deep dialogue with my cousin, Alan, whether he was actually reading the book or not. But I wanted through language to create the emotional and physical closeness that I yearned for that carcerality had um, eviscerated. And, and it was actually through that process of like, the writing process and then the presentational process, which is all performative, that I started meeting other people and co-creating community around system impacted people and their loved ones. And the, the generative force, the energy that was running throughout is a love practice. How do you love? someone in action who might spend the rest of their life in prison? How do you embody that? How do you create, make it haptic, visual? Like, so it's really trying to do that with this project and what it, what it, in doing that, it, produced other forms of love and connection, meaning that like my community kept growing. It was extremely transformative. Um, and it took me a long time to do it, like 10 years, because there were just moments where I was kind of processing what happened um, or what I was experiencing or what my cousin was experiencing. Like, for example, when I first, the first chapter of the first publication that led to marking time was an article called posing in prison and public culture where this image was there and at the time my cousin was still serving life and so I was writing in a really um, vicious temporality of waiting but waiting for what and what is he waiting for during that time of actually working on posing in prison like right before it was in public it was published he was released and so that even shifted that like the energy of me going through the page proofs like totally shifted because there was so much mourning that i was when i was writing that and then he was released um, and so there was a lot of that happening as I was uh, working on this project. Okay, I don't want to talk too long, but I'm just so, but what, what I want to say is that it just led to all these ways that um, 
I was having conversation with other people and it was through this conver these conversations that like these categories of like thinking through the aesthetic practices and the innovation really like I was thinking about like what does it mean to innovate in the space of punitive captivity and immobility and like um, you know where when the state is rendering you someone of no value or someone whose value is a form of extraction that um, as Ruthie says, is, you know, really about geared towards your premature death. Um, so I started coming up with these categories that I think maybe it's best for Russ, uh, for, for Ronak and me to talk about like more in dialogue, but I just want to show you some images uh, that from like that, that this was just through conversation. Like um, I, I came across Ronnie Goodman, who's like, was spent time in San Quentin and then was unhoused in San Francisco. And he just blew my mind when he told me what he was doing in this painting that was much more than just a self portrait of himself as a working artist. He was talking about how he was curating the space around him. He's also memorializing the space because at that time he had his sent release papers. And, and then these categories just started coming up thinking about like penal space and how artists use the space of prisons, the built environment, the social relations the material constraints of prison that I call penal matter, just showing you some examples. And then thinking about the tempor temporality of punitive captivity and then the afterlife of prison um, through, for example, Jared Owens um, uh, mixed media collage of a uh, the Brooks, the slave ship, uh, the icon of the Brooks slave ship um, overlaid by the prison where he was incarcerated in New Jersey. Um, portraits became really important subject matter and then I just want to show you a few images from like why that when you talk about reception the reception of it continues to evolve because it's not no longer just the book it's an exhibition that's like touring and so it was that MoMA PS1 now it's in Birmingham and that's a place of high significance for me and for thinking about carcerality and the you know the, the long history of black captivity um and as it moves into these different spaces, the reception changes, but also the way that the work is arranged and how the works are in conversation, like the works are in the art, quote, objects that are in the show, shift their proximity to other works based on the spatial dimensions, constraints of, of the museums themselves. And so I'm just showing you some images that I'm happy to go back to. And this is from an install that I did like literally the show opened September 17th in Birmingham. So um, that's all I'll say for now. <laughs> I'm a rambler, but Ronak knows that. <laughs> Are you passing things off to me? I'm passing things to Ronak. Sorry well, that that was not a no, smooth I'm passing so off. <laughs> we really can spend 90 minutes just in the awe of the reception of marking time. Let's be honest about that. And Nicole, I'm so grateful to you to be in conversation with you. Thank you, Ivy, Emeka, Ariel, everybody, Buffett for assembling us in this way. I've been looking forward to this for such a long time. And uh, Nicole, you are a genius in the truest sense, not just because MacArthur Foundation decided to finally recognize your gifts this week. And we certainly want to congratulate you about that. But genius in the sense that your brilliance extends out in the world, it's outward focused in the broadest Pisces permeable sense. Um, you are a mentor to so many people. You are a model of care and engagement and disidentification with the perverse logics of academia in so many important ways. And I have so appreciated watching this project bloom over the last decade or so. I've learned so much from your practice. I'm taking notes all the time and the way that you move through the world. Um, so I feel very grateful that the folks at Northwestern have thought to put us in conversation in this way. So thank oh, you. And can we just say, Ronak and I are very good friends yeah. and there's a lot of love between us and we're both Pisces yes. and we text and we love on each other all the time. There's a lot of love that's generated here. <laughs> So I like that you still have your, is your, are your images still up? They are, right? You're still sharing. Okay, your... but oh, I can stop sharing my screen. You ready to oh, share yours? Well, you're, gonna, you're sharing some images too, aren't you? I have some, I have some. Okay, so I'm going to stop. I forgot how this works. Okay, okay. so now I hit share screen. <clears throat> um, my images, you know, I could scroll through a lot of stuff, but you know, what I want to show, how do I do the big thing here? Um, 
and I'm just going to scroll through some stuff because I want to show you the people that I write about and alongside because I think you know one of the things when I've been thinking about working about the reception what I've most most been moved about and you know this is my first book project when I conceptualized this it was the Bush two era um, you know the forever wars on terror are 20 years and counting right uh, that 20 year legacy I started undergrad uh, two weeks after 9 11 and wow. it was one of the first flights from Chicago to the West Coast after everything had been grounded. And uh, so my entire adult life has been um, alongside um, this war on terror project, the project, the Homeland Security State, all of the incredible organizing and activism um, that has happened in multiple communities, but specifically in Arab, Muslim and South Asian communities around questions of detention and deportation. And, anti-imperialism and anti-war and connecting to older histories and struggles of rebellion. So that's to tell you that that's the sort of surrounds in which I came to this project when I said, as I said, you know, conceptualized Bush II era, written and researched primarily during the Obama years, um, finished during Trump. And Nicole knows that I was, because uh, she read drafts of my epilogue um, during that first year of the Trump administration and now circulating in the world of Biden. And why do I say that? Well, because there are multiple permutations of this thing called forever war on terror. And it's a shape-shifting set of strategies and tactics that's changed, um, mostly been out of sight until about a month ago when we saw the spectacular, horrific um, events in Afghanistan and the pullout by the US. and. Um, all of the horrors that continue for the people of Afghanistan and all of the refugees and displaced peoples as well. And, you know, that last act uh, by the United States of a predator drone or a reaper drone striking a humanitarian worker who ran, who worked for a U.S. NGO and killing him and 10 children. That was the last act. The U.S. said that it was an ISIS um, person and an ISIS bomb, but of course, um, reporting that came out immediately showed otherwise. Um, you know, so constant horrific reminders of the way that the war on terror logics, although mostly out of sight and unseen and unheard, continues to permutate across the greater Middle East, across Africa, which is really the epicenter of a lot of counterterrorism strategies and operations today. So how to capture that expanse? You know, that was one of the things I was, one of the things I was grappling with in the project and trying to say, Okay, somebody trained in transnational American studies, how do I talk about the multiple scales and sites and infrastructures of US warfare globally, domestically, et cetera, but also think outside, below, beyond the stranglehold of the frameworks of US counterterrorism and carcerality. And you know, to do that, we have to really disidentify with the state's terms. And that's partly why I use the language of insurgency or insurgent, which of course is so laden with um, you know, the, the histories and discourses of anti-terrorism, counter-terrorism, anti-Muslim racisms and so forth. Um, but what I've been most hardened by, I think, in the more limited reception of my book is that people across disciplines have really resonated with the argument of the book, which is that contemporary art, aesthetics, expressive cultures are actually really crucial and vital to knowing ongoing US warfare and that uh, they're not epiphenomenal or somehow, you know, a cute thing to, to bring out at the end of the storyline, right? Um, even as we've seen all these rehearsals of this problematic in the 20 year sort of retrospectives of the 9-11, of the way that art and culture, especially by experimental avant-garde artists who are diasporic and minoritized people whose communities and kin come from the homelands that are most targeted by US warfare, that those folks tend to not be part of the central conversation, even as we continue to remember the effects of the war on terror 20 years later. So, you know, I'm grappling with the idea that um, the so-called truths of social science um, are insufficient and that we actually, and that they've actually been impoverishing our political imaginations about how to think about terrorism, how to think about political violence, how to think about the way that we are sensuously connected in the world. Um, and of course, the pandemic has intensified and accelerated a lot, a lot of those questions as well that I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss. But um, so the reception is, you know, part of what I've been hardened about is the centrality of art making, as Nicole is speaking to, being really vital across disciplines. The other thing I'm really excited about, and that wasn't the case when I first started this project, is that there is now 
an efflorescence of a new cohort and you know of junior scholars who are doing work on contemporary art about Southwest Asia and the greater Middle East and thinking about diasporic and transnational connections and you know the artists that I write about these folks they are I can't screen I can't move my thing forward there it is um, you know their work is starting to show up on people's syllabi in visual art and visual culture and, and art history classes and performance studies classes and when I was first starting this project I felt um, sort of on an island um, working and cleaving from women of color and queer of color critique and other people's approaches. And um, I'm excited about the sort of next generation of work that's coming. So I'll stop there because I know there's, we actually are trying to talk and not just talk to the screen. We yeah, I, let, me, let me pick up on a couple of threads here. There's, those are really wonderful introductions for our, our audience um, and, a, and a nice kind of that the tap between two really dear um, and amazing, uh, amazing two dear friends and who are also amazing uh, scholars. Um, you know, we we had talked about some few questions, a few questions beforehand, but I I want to just kind of riff a little bit on something that Ronick said in conjunction that kind of resonated with um, with Nicole. And this is um, around the question of detention uh, or there's or states of detention, and it just just reminded me like even though even though we can't delineate time uh, or mark time to borrow uh, Nicole's very useful uh, phrase here, um, you know, we can, we can also think about a certain era or certain kind of epic um, um, that isn't, yeah, that isn't just the era of late capitalism, right? Um, but a different, a different kind of world system where detention and the kind of the valence of uh, freedom and liberty um, get housed in very specific locations. Mm -hmm. Certain locations being the ones that Ronak just mentioned that um, uh, many, many, many locations in Africa are actually, um, if you will, kind of housed by, by the US state, right? Uh, they are occupied in the way that the US occupied Haiti in the early part of the 20th century. But to kind of just to kind of think about this as a think about the kind of geographies of time, if if you will, here. Um, and the photo that Nicole showed at the very beginning, and, and thinking about her own kind of family genealogy here, along with this kind of geography of, of time, like it's clear that so much of the violence being done against Black people um, wasn't just kind of legacies of uh, of slavery, but a very particular kind of neoliberal moment that came not with Bush one. Right, but the kind of Riker Thatcher era of a certain kind of global global uh, global world order. So, what I'm trying to dovetail here are the ways in which um, Clinton's own Crime Bill Act of 1994, right, um, incarcerates black bodies in all kinds of ways, uh, which are kind of resonant and uh, not simply a kind of precursor, but dialectic with the kinds of detention centers that we see in Abu Ghraib and in Sudan that uh, come up in, in, in Ronick's work. So what I'm, inviting, what I'm inviting us to do here collectively is to think about the ways in which these, these zones of detention, uh, whether or not they are San Quentin or whether or not they're Guantanamo Bay, really do give us a, some kind of geography of time about where we are mm -hmm. in, a particular, in a particular kind of world system now, right? That is well beyond late capital. Right, and I was just thinking of Ruthie's very useful term, carceral geography, yeah, yeah. as you're talking like, because for me, I mean, the way that I really, I like my, I like to theorize like many black feminists from like, from the personal, I really do like from my family story. And so like, for me, it is like, the visualization of deindustrialization, like to and, and underemployment in my community as it lined up with hyper incarceration and how that actually changed the infrastructure of the town I grew up in. Like how buildings that were mom and pop stores no longer were mom and pop stores. They were these kind of gray zones where people might be hanging out front, but where there was but became also captive spaces for police to just sweep in and just pick people up really quickly. And how the actual navigating of the streets that I biked along when I was a child became these fortress zones, as we know, the militarization of police led to like the, the changing of their actual roadways in and out of black neighborhoods, right? 
So all those things are, for me, were lining up as a child. And it was like a multi-sensory experience of seeing people around me uh, struggling, like not, not going to work. When I grew up with this very, in the Midwest, with this very labor-centered, like people got up in the morning and they went to work, right? And then like really seeing that shift, but then also how that played out infrastructurally in the, in the town itself. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you know, I, I think another, another key element here that you're getting at Ivy is that the conditions that led to war on terror and everything post 9-11, all of that groundwork was being laid throughout the 20th century. And we know that the carceral yeah, state yeah. and the yeah. warfare state came hand in hand. And, yeah. and we don't even have to talk about the Reagan moment. We can go much early, you know, the work of people like Naomi Murakawa and others who are showing us, actually it's liberals in the 1940s and 50s that are laying the groundwork for the kind of build up, prison build up work. And we know that police and military are two sides of the same coin of global repression. And so, you know, the US has always been innovating tactics, both domestically on racialized populations. So low intensity forms of counterinsurgency against Black, Latinx, Native, Indigenous peoples, right, and or people and freedom movements across the United States. But then it's also been engaged in um, tamping down anti-colonial struggles around the globe. All of that are is the kind of material horror that's baked into the DNA of the Forever War, what I'm calling the Forever War now. And so that's why it's really important to understand, like for my purpose, like we have to explode the notion of not post 9-11. That's not a useful framework because actually really was the 90s when a lot of these people were cutting their teeth and a lot of stuff was happening that laid the groundwork. Right, and the, and the kind of what we now call um, super max prisons, right? I mean, the experiments were really against leftist um, activists right. and freedom fighters, you know, like, so you see, a. Um, like I write about one of the um, a kind of a supermax unit in a prison in yeah. New Jersey that was housed by, it was all BLA, Black Panther. I mean, it was like literally, and that became this, the, the seed for the expansion of uh, maximum security prisons and supermax prisons across the country. You know, yeah. literally experimenting with isolating people with leftist ideology. And the reverse is also happening, right? So the US is also creating these laboratories of empire in AFPAC, for example, on the borderlands between Afghanistan and Pakistan, where all this drone policing is happening. And we know that that drone technology is being then bought by uh, police departments all across the United States. And those military technologies are now becoming routine forms of policing you know, on the south and west side of our own city in yeah. Chicago, for mm -hmm. example. So that sort of interplay, the boomerang effect mm -hmm. to quote Arendt, you know, that, that is an ongoing phenomenon. And what I think is important to note is that it's not just the state that's experiment creating experimental tactics and strategies as it continues to permutate in terms of war making. You know, the insurgent sort of a struggle, activist rebellion is also experimenting, also responding to the dictates of the state and also changing tactics. Mm -hmm. And I think in both of our projects, you see that vividly illustrated through the work of these artists who are also experimenting with practices. I mean, Nicole, your work around the kind of formalist dimension of your project is so resonant you know, and, and compelling to me because you're thinking about like penal matter, right? Like the, what is, like what are the resources that people have at their disposal in order to produce creative forms of expression and how they themselves are warehouse penal matter and they're theorizing that visually yeah right yeah so um Monique, like something you just said here about um again picking up on your broader notion of the of insurgent aesthetics and um and experimentation on um, as a really you know demanding and challenging category for both of your works and i'm also just reminded here of um you know a, from my perspective, you know, a really key work by by Fanon called uh, Voice of Algiers, less read than the other two books, but there's there's a moment in the Voice of Algiers where Fanon is is recounting a story, and Nicole and Ronan know this well, um, where um, the the colonial network is expecting a certain kind of movement um, by the by the insurgents by, by the revolutionaries, right? And the colonized subjects uh, pick on, on the cues, so to speak. And so they begin to strap batteries and knives and guns 
to the thighs of these black women, right? Who, who sashay, who move in a certain kind of way. That is, who choreograph a new revolution, right? Who choreograph an aesthetic, you know, what Ronick would call an insurgent aesthetic, right? Um, the colonizer is expecting a martial phalanx to, to walk in, in, in order, right? And they, they, it's completely inconceivable for them to imagine that women could be revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. right? And now I'm bringing this up too because there's, I mean, Nicole was saying too that she was trying to perform something called proximity. And these black women who were revolutionaries got as close to the gate, got as close as got as close as possible to the borders because it was inconceivable that they would they could choreograph, they could dance or they could dance their way into a revolution, right? It got simply dismissed as merely spectacle, as merely, as mere performance, which is running something that you were saying earlier in your opening comments, like. We can't really we can't we should not reduce these performances to the epiphenomenal, right? They have to be seen as central to uh, aesthetics, to, to to politics, to kind of cultural movement. So I want to I want to kind of shift a little bit to how both of you who are theorists, your cultural critics, you're working also in, in political theory, how how you produce work within and alongside the field of art history even though neither of you were really formally quote unquote trained as art historians. Um, can you describe for us some of your most important research skills yeah. that can you learned I in graduate say, school? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah. Go. <laughs> I thought you were done. I mean, it's a little bit script. of a delay, but all I'm just saying is Ronak is liking your questions because he's rocking. He's like doing this. Did you see that? I was like, Ronak is getting into these questions. Well, I have to say one thing. Uh, it's, it's where, let's no go yeah. we're in person. Before you stick to the script, Ivy, with the, the next now, I, I want us to flow. I mean, I want us to flow. Well, I want to flow back in response to your Fenon thing, which is like, yeah, that's a that's an example of the kind of camouflage and espionage and the kind of choreograph choreography of movement, you know, and, you know, we're going to bob when, and when up when we're expected to weave, you know, that sort of is a minoritized form of knowledge, embodied knowledge that we see yeah. happening in lots of different ways. And part of what I'm also trying to say is like, we have to change our optic to be able to attend to the forms of fugitivity or rebellion or refusal that people are adopting in their practices because they're not gonna look necessarily the way that we expect them to look. And, um, you know, they come, they, they, they speak to the kind of cracks and fissures in the architecture of statecraft, of, of war making. And so that's just what I wanted to say about. Um, that Thank, you. Thank you. But should, should I pick up your question about art history real quickly? And then I'll, I'll really pass it off to the true art historian here, Nicole, which is to say, I'm just a, a casual pastor buyer in the world of art history. I was certainly not trained in art history. And, you know, I was trained by people who were fleeing the disciplines and coming to interdisciplinary spaces. I was, my training is in ethnic studies and American studies. I teach in exclusively in gender and women's studies formation with a series of affiliations, courtesy appointments across campus. Um, so to me, like what I learned in graduate school was about close reading and close reading as an ethics and as a method, as a reading strategy, from women of color and black feminists and queer of color critique. I also learned and internalized a kind of promiscuity and a kind of willful neglect of disciplinary procedures that are put onto us. Um, and I've also experienced continuing even at this mid career moment, a kind of disciplinary uh, a dys uh, dysphoria, if you could put it, if I could say it that way, where I I'm, I, I'm still um, reading widely, citing widely in ways that are sometimes not rewarded by academic logics or that make, make me sometimes feel sort of unintelligible and, uh, and being, being told that I'm being unintelligible when I'm making those turns and, and, and resisting the impulse towards the kind of disciplinary procedure. So that's what I would say, which is partly why uh, I've avoided places and departments that are a little bit more strict. You know, it's so interesting, Ronak, because we, we talked offline a few days ago, and Ronak was saying that his work often is recognized and praised in fields that he, that are, would ancillary be the word, that are not like necessarily the areas that he was like trained in to teach. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of just thinking about critical reception too, it's also like, I think it is the gift or the surprise of finding yourself in conversations that you may have not imagined your work touching upon and, and really being praised in those areas. Is there some truth to that, 
around that? Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I want to put the question back to you as um, somebody who's taking in quite a bit of reception and quite a bit of love in this moment in relationship to Mark and time. How has your own thinking about your disciplinary location changed over the course of your career? Uh, well, um, so I'm a Midwesterner and <laughs> a working class Midwesterner now living in Harlem. And so there's everything you, I just grew up with everyone saying, take everything with a grain of salt. <laughs> like that was just like, so every, all of this is with a grain of salt, which means to have some healthy distance to praise. Um, and I think that I, for me, the irony of that is that my very first, I, and I like to tell this to grad students too, especially grad students who are trained in interdiscipl interdisciplinary studies like Ronak, all my degrees are in interdisciplinary studies. Like literally my bachelor, I have a bachelor of philosophy in interdisciplinary studies. I have a master's and PhD in modern thought and literature. I've never been trained. I've never been interested in being in a traditional discipline. And I have definitely been punished um, as I, uh, you know, I am at a moment where, yes, there's a lot of, oh, you know, praise and recognition, but there's been many moments where that hasn't been the case. And, I, and an example is the very first job interview I had, like my first campus visit um, when I was finishing up my dissertation at Stanford was to, um, and I'll just name them, it was USC, American Studies and Art History. And a senior white woman in art history, when I was a finalist doing my campus visit, said to me publicly, like after my talk, I don't think you've ever taken art history class. It was like the most horrifying, humiliating thing that I was like a 27 year old PhD student. I mean, it was really like just traumatizing. The irony is like 20 years later to the date. So that <laughs> happened in 2001. <laughs> February 2001, February of 2021, the College Arts Association, which has been around for 110 years, give me their top two book awards. And that was unprecedented. They've never given that to anyone. So they gave me the book award in art history and art criticism. So I have to take all that with a grain of salt. <laughs> I mean, like, and it just shows me that these di disciplines and fields, they're constantly shifting, right? That, that, that I mean, this is to me like the proof that the, the idea that, you know, that you can kind of create these walls, uh, gatekeeping, but, you know, it's just like, it's a, it's a fiction that, you know, it's only those who are afraid who are trying to do the gatekeeping. Ah, well, that's the, you know, it's not like the discipline has radically ch changed overnight, even as no, you're recognizing no. <laughs> your gift and brilliance, right? It's instead a recognition that you can be hype, there's hyper visibility and deep in invisibility simultaneously. I'll, I'll right. Also, I know this yeah. is we're recording this, but Nicole, I've told you that story that <laughs> a very prominent art historian at a job talk that I gave on a, at a very prestigious institution in New York made a similar comment to me publicly that about, you don't know what you're talking about here in relationship to art history. So I think a lot of us carry a lot of us interdisciplinary types, you know, carry those um, experiences um, with us as we move through institutions and grain of salt is a great way to capture um, the kind of aesthetic and emotional and affective distance one needs. Um, and and in the Midwest, I think is very. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, Chicago, I mean, Chicago, I mean, Chicago is, you know, Chicago is a certain kind of center of the Midwest, uh -huh. so to speak. And, you know, part, partly what I hear about taking this with a grain of salt is, is, is also not being too kind of fastidiously entrenched in disciplinarity, right? Too committed or overcommitted, as it were, to a mode of thinking, right? So, or a mode I, of reading, a way of being. And so part of, what, part of what I'm hearing in both of you is, um, and we've all gone through the academy at a kind of certain moment in the late, you know, the late 90s or mid to late 90s, so you know, kind of uh, on the tail end of the culture wars, but, um, the U.S. culture wars, but kind of embedded in a larger set of, of, of other wars um, to, um, to, put, to put in high relief many of the things that Ronak helpfully uh, reminds us of. But it's, it seems like in the kind of academic, in the kind of academic valence, there's, there's something about both your works that are, that are pushing interdisciplinary. So not simply like giving us, you know, like one model of, of interdisciplinarity was 
history and literature. Another was ethnic studies and gender sexuality studies. But it seems to me that both of your works, um, especially in the books, but in your wider orbit as well, is thinking about a certain kind of valence or tension between interdisciplinarity on the one hand and what uh, Ronak, you said earlier, you it's really brilliant quote of like fleeing the disciplines, right? That's, that's not quite interdisciplinarity, right? Uh, there's something, there's one about the kind of admixture or what kind of Pat Williams would call it, a certain kind of alchemy, right? We can call that kind of alchemy of, the, of interdisciplinarity. But Ronak, you said, well, I've, I've always been seduced by fleeing the, fleeing the disciplines. Right? And I wonder if both of you could talk a little bit more about fugitivity as a kind of intellectual practice, Intell uh, fugitivity, not simply as a kind of political mandate in addition to a kind of sociality, but fugitivity as a intellectual practice. Nicole, especially for you, where some of your subjects um, are less mobile, right? Have less opportunity to, to move and to, to, to be mobile. How can we think about fugitivity as an intellectual practice? Well, I mean, the thing is art making in prison is fugitivity in practice. Like it's not a, it's not, you know, figurative. It literally is like how people get access to materials, how they move materials around, how they innovate with uh, materials. But I mean, honestly, I, for me, I, I'm not beholden to a field, a discipline. And I don't mean it like, um, I don't care. Like I'm, I'm actually deeply invested in the American Studies Association. I want that to thrive. I want to, and I will, it's some, I'll give my labor to ASA because to me that is an important association um, to continue to become something special and magical, especially for first generation professors, for all kinds of minoritized discourses. Um, but I write, I'm motivated by questions and not necessarily who I'm in conversation with. So I don't, I like have a question and I teach this in methods. I love actually teaching methods, interdisciplinary methods. So I have students come up with questions and then we figure out like what different, different you know, methods would look like to approach that question. I do that all the time with my own research. I actually think a lot about like the method. And so it's like, how do I get a, a kind of effective dimension in this project that I want to like radiate throughout it? And it was through really a radical love practice that comes from freedom movements. And so how do you actually put that, how do you write through that instead of writing about it, right? Like how is that like actually a writing practice? Um, so I say that to say I'm constantly, I'm constantly, I actually spend a lot of time, I, I, and I do this, like I have, I have a writing practice that has evolved over a couple of decades that when I started, I was so gray about it. I was like, I don't know if this is working. And now I trust it because it has worked for me. And it starts off with me writing as in the messiest form I can write. And then, it start, and then I start honing questions. I don't write, use an outline. I don't write in a linear kind of way, but I hone questions. I'll write, rewrite the question over and over and over again. And then the methods will start to emerge for me about like how I get at that question. And I also want to be chasing the question and never be able to fully answer it. So if that compels me, I get up in the morning because I like want to chase a question, but not ever be able to feel like I can really um, fully exercise that question. Ooh, that's priceless advice right there. The Fleetwood method. I'm going to have that to- That is my method. There are a lot of grad <laughs> students in the Zoom. I hope that folks are taking notes because um, I can definitely resonate with the, your process to some degree about, you know, starting in those ways and not outlining, but, you know, the driving from, in hunger that fuels the project when you wake up, like that was very um, vivid for me the last several years with this book. And and I'm a little in a cloudy phase with my second, you know, this next project I was saying to Nicole, you know, it's like starting all over again, but from a very different, a lot more tired and a, from a different vantage point at a different moment. Um, but that question of fugitivity, just briefly, like, you know, I, I teach the grad core 
GWS theory and methods courses too. And I love that. And our students come from across campus, not just in the humanities and social sciences, but from nursing and public health and urban studies. And, you know, it changes the quality and tenor of the kinds of conversations you have when you have to really seriously talk across disciplines and also just have deep love and respect for people who are trying to survive and make do in disciplines and doing really immersion and creative and interesting work in those spaces too. Um, so I think it's a real synthetic process, you know, just reading widely, um, you know, not getting bogged down in any one way of thinking. And then for me, like in this book, it was like the art is what drove the question. The art, I had to learn all this stuff because I was grounded in these art objects, which then, you know, the critique emanates from the art, I would hope. Um, so that's, that was my process. Right. Both of you have been talking um, recently about method and disciplinarity. We could shift a little bit to uh, questions of scale and uh, back to geographies. And specifically for this audience in particular, how would you both define the global in your, in your studies, in your approaches, in your scope? Um, how do your respective projects fit into kind of an international studies paradigm or a global studies paradigm or global anglophone, global aesthetics. Um, and Monica has already touched upon this um, by insisting upon not moving art to the peripheral, what he's calling the phenomenal, but how do you center um, the art and, and visual culture as a significant component of, of global studies? And we, we actually had a, little a good back and forth talking about this beforehand yeah um and for me it's always about thinking about the hyper specific and hyper local that's how that's how i approach global studies is actually through like the the um this the, the cell in solitary confinement And I have the sort of converse, very macro world system sort of brain, like that kind of abstraction is where I enjoy hanging out. And so, mm -hmm. and I have to work to go back to the specificity of the concrete matter in front of me. And, um, you know, I, I don't love, I use the term global, I put global war on terror, global empire, domestic and global dimensions of US war making, carcerality, et cetera. I, I, that language is certainly ever present in my project. But part of what I've learned from studying US war making is that it's they imagine it to be, the state imagines it to be deeply deterritorialized, de right? A borderless war, an everywhere war to use Derek Gregory's terms. So then that, that poses a set of epistemological and ethical questions about how do you study, how do you find the thing that is supposed to be diffuse and everywhere and not just spatially geographic, like ge geography, like lots of different countries, but then also levels of spectrum and scale. So the fact that war is on land, it's in sea, it's in cyberspace, it's in outer space, right? So thinking about the literally the multiple scales with full spectrum dominance is the phrase that the US military uses to describe their project, which is to say, we're gonna securitize and militarize outer space. Yeah. Oh, okay. So then, you know, there, how do we talk about the sort of uh, outer planetary dimensions of U.S. empire? That's that's how I think about. It. So global to me is like regional, transnational, diasporic, migrant. These are all concept metaphors to describe different sort of scale of processes. And global is a useful can be a useful one. But then I'm also resonant that I was trained by transnational feminists who were critiquing the notion of global feminism, like the idea of a kind of global sisterhood, mm -hmm. an idea of, of sameness, universal sameness, right? And actually saying, no, we have to attend to the sort of specificity of people's experiences and then build transnational forms of solidarity and coalition. So, um, sorry, Buffett Institute, but- that, <laughs> No, I like that. I like what you, you said. And I, and I like it and, you know, I like your, I like, I like as in Andy Warhol, like, like, like the like in that kind of way, there's an affinity, there's, I like, I'm learning, like, like, we have this deep dialogue and we're writing from very deep, different scales, right? But it, it's so resonant, like that, you know, Ronak is one of my first readers for something that I'm trying to work through and always gives me such great advice. And I think that we see the resonance in the scales that we're, we see how they are in such um, intimate conversation. I've been thinking about this too, because I'm trying to, 
I'm trying to clarify my investments in the study and teaching of black feminisms, which is very central to my pedagogy. I teach classes on abolition and decolonization. I, I teach feminist theory and it's like six weeks of core canonical work in black feminism, right? And I'm like, what is that about when, you know, even if you look at my citational practice, I'm reading, well, it's because I think black feminists are doing the most innovative and interesting work about the archive, about questions about memory, about visuality, you know, again, Nicole. So remember when I got in trouble by calling yes. you a black feminist at Northwestern? <laughs> <laughs> that black feminist. Oh, that was at Northwestern. Kathy. No, no, we, 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 we all remember that. We all remember that. I got in trouble for that. <laughs> that was funny. But my point being is like, no, I'm not. But how do those, how do non-black people of color in the academy who are learning alongside and teaching this ethics and this reading practice, um, do justice, especially for majority non-Black graduate students. And, you know, like, so I'm just thinking through, especially Black studies is like a worlding enterprise and everybody needs to be engaged in that practice. What does that look like? And how can, and how can Black studies and like decolonial studies be in conversation more neatly? And to refine that you are a child of Black feminism though. You're a child of it. You're a student of it. Certainly, and Chicana yeah, feminism, and Shereen Moraga was my undergraduate mentor, right? So, Ivy, we're losing your video on and off. I don't know. I yeah, it keeps going in and out. And now your sound. Now you you're muted. We can't hear you. I, have a, I had a bad connection. I was trying to make it make it okay. better. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that one of one of the, you know, beyond obviously the kind of the, the immediate rapport that you two have as friends and as, as interlocutors, like I think part of the reason why we in the Buffett were so mesmerized about this particular pairing is that it might not seem immediate to, to uh, at first glance that Nicole would be occupied with the global, right? Or that Ronick would be occupied with the hyperlocal, but the, the, the pairing of this conversation reminds us of the kind of the dialectical machinations between what uh, Ronick was earlier noting the, the carceral state and the relationship to the welfare state and, and the reverse. And so the, and the kinds of outlines of certain legislations that I pointed out that happened with, um, that happened with Bill Clinton that got extended obviously with Bush too. And even, not, not, not even, but of course Obama, there's no reason to think that Obama would not have extended some of those protocols, right? And so I think we delude ourselves into thinking that because he's committed to a certain kind of internal national racial politics, that he would otherwise be excluded from the, the kind of the machinations of the way that the US has always operated in a kind of geopolitical sense. So, so one question I want to ask, kind of pushing along a little bit further about the, um, the relationship with the hyperlocal to the global or the national is that when Nicole was saying like, for me, there's a, a deep attention to the hyperlocal down to the cell, right? And we might take a kind of anthropological perspective on that, like reading where the concrete came from, reading where the, the steel came from, who did the kind of organization of the prisons, um, and also see the ways in which the US prison system gets exported elsewhere, right? And the ways in which detention centers get, get imported to the US. And so thinking along the lines of carcerality, I wonder if both of you could talk about how your attention to the to the international residences right, or the, the local residences really do show how the, the US is doing something that seems to be particular, but it's actually operationalizing in a much wider kind of orbit. Well, I mean, one really concrete thing, I mean, I think a lot of people know about this that like the NYPD exporting stop and frisk <laughs> to like urban centers in Europe and like globe, like asking, being asked to go to like cities in England to show local police forces how to operationalize stop and frisk, like literally how to start doing it on the streets. Um, so for me, that's, but I think a lot of people know that as one like really concrete example. Um, I don't, I don't think but, I don't think enough people know that I should. Oh, go. but it's I mean they yeah, yeah. yeah and and also then the, and I mean we can just stay with the new NYPD like its relationship with Israel right and the fact that it is not only the largest police force in the U.S. perhaps globally I, I can't say that for sure but it's also if you were to just isolate it and look at it as like a military force it would be a really formidable 
military force against like most countries in the world, right? And so it, it has imported so much, uh, you know, military infrastructure. And I mean, in material, you know, in, in terms of intelligence, cyber, cyber you know, forms of surveillance. Um, and it's also facile that it can very quickly operationalize very, you know, like to, you know, the lock and block. And that's how we lock and block. That's how we talk about property units in New York. Um, these various levels of domestic and international warfare, right? Like let's very, add, very. Let's, let's add an example. So Giuliani's uh, security firm, you know, private security firm, you know, is consulting for the Israeli government, as pointed out, but also for U.S.-Mexico border. So, you know, the military planners, defense experts, that whole cottage industry is very much in conversation with the domestic urban policing and urban counter. The hyper local policing too, right? I mean, like the oh, yeah. like what we call like community policing, right? Well, community so policing. <laughs> like the neighborhood yeah. level. Yeah, and, and community policing is a form of domestic counterinsurgency. Yeah, exactly, and absolutely. Also, and, and we should also, let's go even further that our university sites are also sites of militarization. So, you know, on my campus at UIC, there's an organized, ongoing campaign about getting the CIA off of our campus, getting the CVE programs, countering violent extremism, those sort of public-private partnerships between universities and Homeland, Secu Homeland Security state apparatuses, that's I'm sure happening at Northwestern, and I encourage folks to you know to think through those partnerships. It's happening in museum spaces, so let's not also art wash the kind of curatorial, amazing curatorial work that's happening that we're seeing across the board, because we know that the boards of a lot of these museums and art galleries are also enmeshed in the workings both of the carceral state and the warfare state. So if we want to talk about collaboration now, right? I think you know there's a kind of nexus here about university. Muse, you know, museum, militarism that is often um, eschewed, you know, it's often ignored in terms of these kinds of spaces when we talk about the presentation of art and expressive culture. So I, I, I want, that's a leading thought here about the notion of collaboration, which is to say that experts, so-called experts and the state apparatus is always in correspondence, always in global collaboration. So, and I'm putting a link for American artists um, video, My Blue Window, which was about predictive policing mm. and surveillance. And it's like, it's meant to be like a not so distant future, but actually the time is in the past. And it was like when um, New York City actually like kind of inaugurated predictive policing. Um, and so it's like through the, through the, the entire film is shot through, um, a local patrol, like doing community policing and kind of predicting where um, a quote crime is about to happen. It's a, it's a really brilliant project. And American artist is one of the artists who's also in the Marking Time exhibition, just mm -hmm. kind of connecting some of these issues that, that we're talking about. It's a very, very, very powerful video. Amazing. I'm going to put in the chat a book that, you know, of a colleague, Stuart Trader, who's written about this nexus, about thinking about po the role of domestic policing and, and global policing in their, in their correspondence. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time here. We're at one o'clock and I'm going to ask maybe one more question. I know there are questions that are going to be posted to me in the Q&A. So I will, I will fill them. Ariel has written in the chat. Thank you all for joining us for today's New Frontiers Conversations. Please share your questions with her. She'll pass them on to me and I will pose them to professors Fleetwood and Kapadia. So um, um, multiple levels of mediation and ventriloquism going on there. So um, please put your questions in the, pass them on the RL and then I will um, read them off. So one, you know, one, you know, we talk, we've talked about um, how to think about globality, um, how to think about disciplinarity, how to think about uh, methods, um, now, I just want to touch in my kind of final question here uh, about the kind of ethics of collaboration or uh, engagement. Nicole had this really, um, this really intimate and this, I think, also really vulnerable uh, expression of of um, of yearning for a, a practice to enact to enact what she called 
proximity. And Ronick was also talking a great deal a moment ago, just uh, I mean, insight, insightfully as well about collaboration. And I wonder if you can both share with us, especially um, underneath the kind of aegis of the, the, the global, I mean, the Buffett Institute for Global Studies, um, a different ethics, a different practice for how to think about engagement. One that's perhaps not on a Cold War model of, uh, of um, geopolitics, that's not on a 19th and early 20th century model of anthropology where the learned, usually white male comes in and analyzes a, a culture over here. But each of you have gone out and done um, interviews, collaborations that feel different than IRB. They feel different than ethnographies. And so there's a, there's a kind of ethics to your practice of collaboration that are pushing out what it means to expand a geography, a, a space of, of, of interaction. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what does it mean to engage with folks as an artist, um, as someone who working principally in aesthetics rather than development or currency or white papers, any of the other kind of social science things that almost always underwrite academic global studies. What does it mean to approach a notion of collaboration on a scale from Nicole's hyperlocal to Monique's global or diasporic or international when, when collaboration is at the core of what you're doing rather than kind of, as again, as Nicole said, um, to write with these people and to work through these ideas rather than to write about them, right? So those folks over there doing this, this thing. And so this, 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 this ethics or this practice of collaboration amounts more than a kind of method. It's in fact, well, from my perspective, at least the kind of ethics. And I wonder if you would say a little bit more about how that ethics of collaboration gets telescoped through or filtered through aesthetics and art that might make it different for how we think about global studies separate from or next to or adjacent to political science, to anthropology, to development, to currency, to, to any of those others, especially social science disciplines that usually underwrite or the foundations for global studies. I like that question. It's good. You know, one of the things that I just wanna say that um, answers it for me is not, is, 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 what results from it than maybe what was the intention going into it. And Naeem is who's an artist in um, Ronex Project. How, how do you pronounce Naeem's last name? Moaiman, Moaiman. Naeem Moaiman? Yes. Came to see Marking Time at PS1, brought his students. His students were writing about it. We ended up being at a group dinner and he was just saying how resonant it was, right? And so the through line is, I mean, and, and it went somewhere else. And then his student wrote a paper about car so aesthetics, but it was through like also this, you know, this approach to the global and, and I could never, you know, that's something that I could not foresee, right? And so I'm answering this question in the, the through the aftermath of it. Uh, then, then the kind of a forethought, but I am, um, I often, my relationship to theorization and to scholarship is, is not um, linear or logical. I'm, I'm just intuitive and I write intuitively and Ronak felt right for me to be writing with, like that felt like the, like it felt right. It res it was resonant with me. And, um, and so I do think that we also have to trust our instincts when we're doing these projects about where we keep being led to. And there's been many moments where I was led to continuing a conversation with Rona, right? And so for me, that's a way of thinking like outside of the logic of uh, the production model of the university to get A, B, C, D done. But it was like, this actually feels very right. Not this is what I'm trying to result. It, 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 I mean, I don't know that it's very intuitive for me. 
it's the Pisces in us, <laughs> you know, deeply kind of almost witchy, very intuitive. I would say, you know, uh, that's really lovely, Nicole. And, you know, collaboration and curation, right? These are forms of organizing. They're kind of prefigurative practices in the sense like you're doing work and you don't know, as you just said, you know, you don't know what the results are gonna, how it will bloom, what the forms of connections that will emerge. Like we can't know that in advance. So it's an, it's an anticipatory gesture towards the horizon, you know, um, which is I think very queer utopian to some degree as well. And an abolitionist as well. Yeah, well. That's what I was just gonna say. Yeah, you know, deeply abolitionist, like making the world as we walk, right? Like for that, um, that near, near horizon. So organizing is an antidote to both neoliberal and necropolitical dictates of the here and now. It's like the, it's the reservoir, it's the ammunition, it's a, res a vital resource um, against the stultifying and dystopian here and now. That's like how I would talk about, you know, what the role of collaboration and organizing is. And also I would say now having reflected on this solo authored book project, you realize just the immense amount of energy and affect that goes into producing scholarship and that it involves mentors and editors and chosen family and um, you know teachers and all the kind of interdisciplinary curators and artists and activists that we've come into contact, contact with. And it's, um, you know, talk about Global Village, right? It's like, you know, <laughs> that there are so many sensuous affiliations that have to emerge in order for um, work to, to come out in the world. And so that's what I would leave that with, you know, the idea that um, you can't know in advance the kinds of forms of coalition and solidarity that will emerge, but there's a kind of promise, a, a kernel of promise that's really vital mm -hmm. to get the, your engine going and to get the, the work moving. Great. I wanna, we, we our, our time in this part is, is just about coming to an end. I know that, that both of you are really involved with American studies. We're, we're all members of the association and, I'm and right. yeah. I, I, yeah, um, the, 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 I wonder if you could just say like why, like, you know, in, 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 an, in an era where um, global American studies or transnational American studies, like the different kinds of monikers that have, or kind of adjectives that have modified this thing called American studies. There was a kind of multicultural American studies version for a while. Um, one thinks about that organization, uh, this seems to uh, ostensibly be about the US and its aftermath or its US and its orbit, if you will. Um, how can we think about doing American studies work in a kind of global context? And what, uh, what's the promise of, you know, in some respects too, like there, there, there was a move as, 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 as we're all familiar like with in the late nineties when it was an important intervention when we kind of destabilize or deprioritize the centrality of the US in American studies and folks are working on, on Mexico, on, on Cuba, on, on Canada, on Hawaii, on the, on the Philippines. And that's partly about giving us a different, a different geography, but and thinking about futurity and thinking about collaboration and thinking about, you know, a kind of return to, or the insistence of a return to a certain kind of labor politics of organizing and how do we reorganize? How do we reassemble um, our entry into American studies so that it doesn't kind of recursively get batted by the nation state? What do we see your work, both of your work as, as, you know, as two of the most leading scholars in this vanguard of American, we don't need to be one, two of the most, two of the most important scholars in this generation of American studies scholars pushing both, you know, the kind of the territorial boundaries of it. Um, again, Nicole, in your sense, kind of hyper-local sense and also the kind of methodological sense, right, as well. Um, where do we see the kind of placement of American studies in, in, in global studies? I really like that question. And, and I think we all know the kind of Cold War dirty history of American studies. And I think one of the things that I, I appreciate about American studies as the association, let me just say, is the layering of these histories. I, I do feel like there are some associations where there is an erasure, there's still attempts to erase and to um, add tokens <laughs> now, like, oh, let's add a, let's uh, stick ones. But I think 
going to a, an ASA convention is fraught. And I think that fraughtness is like the history of this country laid bare where these conversations are critically happening. Um, and where arguments are actually generative, like, are, you know, I think that, you know, we, the politics of nice means that people are not having really robust conversations. Um, and I do think ASA is a space that ho holds space for that kind of intensification to take place. And it can be daunting and overwhelming, I think, especially for a junior scholar to go into that, those kind of space, spaces. But I also do think it's a place of incredibly generous mentorship. I have met some of my uh, most significant peer mentors and people of a generation before me, and as well as being mentored by people younger than me has taken place through ASA. And so it is a, it, in that way, I do think it is, it holds space, it gives space, it allows space. Um, even if you think about like how sometimes the panels and, and events are structured as opposed to like MLA that where it's like super hyper, hyper regimented, right? So that just that model of like how the actual um, panels take place also allows for these emerging conversations, emergent conversations, dissident conversations, arguments. And I think argumentation is, arguing is actually very important. I'm someone who can be like <laughs> averse to conflict, but I'm like, actually that's the space where really where possibility conflict is like, I think it's like the tension of something that needs <laughs> to be let out and then co-creation uh, co can take place. Um, so those are some of the things I love about the association mm. ASA. What Thank I want to say is that I realized that what a American studies looks like on campuses can be very different. And I have been in various American studies departments and I have seen like old guard Americana, you know, have a very different, have a very difficult time as allowing gender and queer studies, not even allowing this wrong, wrong work, actually being able to even acknowledge like those fields, right? And have a, and be able to even like have a conversation with people coming from those, like, you know, I don't want to name names, but I've been in some places where there's just such a gap between the kind of conversations of, of like an old guard and what's really happening, like in this emergent field um, that I think, again, on the hyperlocal, American studies can look very, very different, right? Than what the association, and you see a lot of people who are like, and I owed guard is just a, a catch all who, ha, who have stopped showing up to ASA because of its um, stance on Palestine, because of its uh, very, you know, active promotion of uh, non white, queer, gender non conforming students, you know, like really <laughs> shifting. Uh, the dynamics of power and then and that might be what it is is that I feel like power is the idea of power and how to operationalize power institutionally and as academics is really something that uh, is being confronted and experimented with in American studies I don't see it happening in other associations at all I've got, I find other associations to be incredibly hierarchical and I'm bringing up associations as they reflect nationally on the tenor mm -hmm. of fields mm -hmm. and, and departments. That's all well said. And I will also concur that ASA and American Studies is my intellectual home. And I'm on the council because I care about the um, future of the institution of ASA and of that all that you're describing, Nicole, all those transformations over the last two or three decades that have prioritized decolonial and race radical and queer and feminist and trans and POCO interventions into the thing that was the Cold War exceptionalist American studies that you're describing. One thing to add to this, I would say, is like, what is the American studies? What are the futures of American studies? Which I think is sort of, you know, the kernel, the question you asked, Ivy, is like, what is American studies going to mean or U.S. American studies going to mean um, in the period of U.S. imperial decline, which, of course, we're already in, uh, but that we have not fully captured 
the full resonance of the effect of that in the world. So like, what will American studies look like and mean when the US Academy is not the metropole of academic and you know, knowledge production in the globe, that's already starting to shift and change, or when the US is not the only superpower left in the world, that's also shifting, right? So I think what's so interesting is that a lot of these shifts in American studies happen in the post-Cold War era in the early 90s. That was a really moment where we're like, oh yeah, we have to talk about culture and imperialism and empire, and it really, sh and then we have to expand the transnationalism, right? So 90s onwards, American studies has revitalized a lot of conversations because they have been resonating with conversations happening in ethnic studies and black studies and native studies in all these other decolonial studies spaces. And then I guess for me, it's like in addition to all the Palestine organ, you know, solidarity work that's happening in places like American studies, like native North American indigenous studies and global indigenous studies has really transformed the logics. How do we talk about the ends, not only of American studies or futures or ends of American studies, but the futures and ends of the US nation state project as, an, as, a, as a paradigm, um, if we take seriously the demands and it dictates of decolonization. So those are sort of bigger horizon questions, I guess, to put on the table, or, uh, but things that are on my mind. But, but then it does show the residents of uh, America, because I think if, I think indigenous studies, North American indigenous studies has pushed in the last decade, I mean, it's been ongoing, but I feel like there's been a real transformation in how ASA sees itself and talks about itself, partly through the radical work of so many, Robert Warrior, Mashana Goldman, there's, you know, just, I can name a ton of like sure. amazing scholars who are pushing this conversation. And then it's like, then there's these really amazing conversations that are happening around what is indigeneity, like and transnationalism. You think about Shona Jackson's work, thinking about the Caribbean and indige indigenous studies. You think about the really wonderful book with the, um, that came out, um, the, is it the Black Show? Did I say it correctly? Uh, Tiffany Cole. Yeah, oh, yeah, Tiffany. like, I mean, yeah, right. Tiffany, so yeah. then like really, so then it's also making us rethink what is territoriality too, right? Sure. You know? Um, and sedimentation and layered histories and, you know, and, and, and some of that work, some of the foreground of that work was done, I think, by early, earlier generations of scholars thinking about the Black Atlantic, just thinking about other ways of thinking about geographies and the layering of history, right? And so ASA continues to be this container for a lot of those kinds of conversations, even as it deconstructs the idea of America, you, you know, U.S., U.S. exceptional music. U.S. empire and so forth. Absolutely. Right. So speaking of layers and sedimentation, um, I want to layer some more love and praise upon you. This has been an amazing conversation. Um, you know, in some respects, you two can just take this on the road. Uh, it's just uh, it'd be a great tag team and, and tandem um, for folks working in, in so many different fields in gender sexuality studies, uh, in global studies, in aesthetics. Um, in minority discourses, it'd be really lovely for um, for so many of our other colleagues who aren't here on this particular call to see you two in action in tandem in such a kind of electric and contagious and really um, you know loving way um, or a practice of love as as Nicole called it earlier uh, today. We just shift gears here a little bit here. Uh, again, I want to thank you both on behalf of the uh, Buffett in Institute for International uh, Studies. It was a real delight for me to be in conversation with uh, both of you, at least on the outside, listening to both of you uh, talk so insightfully um, uh, together and share with us. Um, Can I say something before you? I are you going to cl close us off? Are you? Or I'm not, are you I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't have any powers like that. Okay. I, I didn't know if you were. Because I just think as we're sitting here talking, I'm, it, like, I really also think just this conversation, like we haven't said it, but it also is about the way that students and, 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 and scholars have shifted Black and Asian studies and like conversations between Black and Asian populations, right? And this is again, working against US exceptionalism and models of like criminality and, exceptional populations, right? right. So it's a, it's a conversation that I think generationally people st that starts in also often in classrooms and are in undercommons or where people are like, there's something fucked up about how certain population, how we're talking about, 
minoritized populations in this country, right? And so it's only through like these ongoing conversations that like where we're not naming race in some ways, but I do think that this is also really much, very much a kind of conversation that is about race and about how, and racial formation and what it means to unpack and reimagine and, and, and shift the dialogue. Mm. And taking seriously that comparative and relational turn within our fields, you know, towards comparative racialization and all those questions, but then also resisting the disciplinary silos of our ethnic studies food group models that mm-hmm. they'll make these conversations difficult to have or still somehow unintelligible to majorities of scholars. Our first panel was at a critical race and yeah. ethnic studies conference. Yeah, it was at US. And it was on carceral aesthetics. And, and I was presenting a very early version of this. And and Ronak was presenting a very early version of his project. Uh-huh. I think you read for imposing in prison. Yeah, yeah, I did. Mm-hmm. So I can see that Klaus has come on and he um, is someone who's helping us moderate these discussions. Again, I wanna thank everyone on behalf of the Buffett Institute for Global Studies. It's really, um, this really amazing Buffett Institute for International Studies They're for you know really um, impactful and important conversation. Um, I think the balance of the time is going to shift to the global impact form uh, graduate students who uh, are lucky enough to, to be in conversation with you in a more intimate setting of 15 to 16 students. So again, uh, many, many thanks. And um, I'm sure I'll be talking with both of you very, very soon. Right. Cheers, Thank everyone. You, Thank you, Ivy. Thank you, Ivy. Cheers, bye. Thanks. Session. Um, so I'd, I'd like you, I'd like to thank you too, um, uh, Nicole and Ronak and Ivy. Uh, for a, a really a, a delightfully unsettling and layered dialogue that I, I think was um, was just wonderful to listen in on. And so we're really, really thankful to have you um, be part of our, our community. Um, I'd also like to, to uh, as we always do, thank um, uh, Roberta uh, Buffett-Elliott, um, whose contributions and supports um, are very central to our efforts to advance diverse forms of inquiry and seek global impact in a changing world. And today's conversation is, is one of uh, the many that we that we actually uh, can run. Uh, thanks for everyone who attended. Um, uh, please do subscribe to our mailing list if you haven't done so, so you receive up-to-date news about future New Frontiers um, uh, conversations, as well as uh, other bu- bu- uh, Buffett activities. Um, I think that's it on my end. Um, So thank you again for for joining um, and we hope to see you uh, next time.